Hello everybody, I'm KC and welcome to an edition of Let's Talk About and welcome to the latest installment of To Infinity War and Beyond. Did you think 2 Infinity War and Beyond was over just because half of our beloved heroes were blinked out of existence? Think again! Because after everything we've been through, it's time to have some fun again in Ant-Man and the Wasp. After the incident in Civil War, Scott was put under house arrest for two years. But just days before his sentence is up, Scott starts seeing visions connected to his time in the Quantum Realm that force Hank and Hope to bust him out in the hopes that that connection will be the lifeline they need to get Janet Van Dyne back. So the race is on to rescue Janet before others who want to use the Quantum Realm's powers can interfere. This is probably one of the most feel-good Marvel movies out there, which is refreshing after, well, you know. It's just an enjoyable ride. It keeps up the heist movie vibe, but instead of one big job, it's several smaller chases and roadblocks from several different characters who all want the same thing, access to the Quantum Realm. It breezes by because there's always something entertaining going on on screen. With our main heroes technically on the run from the law, various locations, and high energy action and chase scenes, it manages to keep a similar tone to the first movie without telling the same story over again. But they do take the time to slow down and let you know why all of this is important, and it doesn't let the consequences of what's happened before pass. Right away, this movie addresses the price Scott had to pay for his actions in Civil War, and charges straight into one of the biggest hanging plot threads from the last movie, Finding Janet. And those obstacles may not be as challenging as some of the other MCU adventures, but it's still strong since this is one of the few Marvel movies that's almost entirely character focused. The villains are either superfluous, or not really villains, and our heroes are all driven by one thing, getting their families back together. Keeping up the theme of this franchise, Scott spends most of this movie just trying to make up for the consequences of what he did when he went to help Cap. How much he actually screwed up depends on where you fall on the whose side are you on argument, but he doesn't try to fall back on shortcuts like in the first movie. He serves his time and works on building a legitimate business, a security business called XCON. Okay, I know Scott started a security business in the comics, but this one has a much better name, that's great. The only reason he agrees to risk breaking his house arrest is to help Hank and Hope to make up for how much trouble he got them into after breaking the Sokovia Accords. A lot of this might seem like we're repeating the arc of the first movie, but when you consider that Scott got in trouble for following what he set out to do in the first movie, being a hero, it adds a bit more to the conflict. And I didn't think Scott's relationship with his daughter could get any sweeter, but oh my gosh, we have reached a new level of preciousness. From the elaborate cardboard tunnels he built in his house to entertain Cassie while he's under arrest, to the fact that Cassie covers for him while he's away doing Ant-Man stuff and wants to be his sidekick, it's too adorable, I can't even deal. But Scott isn't the only one with sweet family moments. Hank certainly got his fair share of growth in this movie, but the big standout is Hope, because she got the big upgrade we've all been waiting for. For. Hold on, you gave her wings? Hope finally dons the identity of the Wasp, and it's just as awesome as we hoped it would be. At first, I was worried about the costumes, since I thought the lack of yellow compared to most of the other versions would make it duller, but it's still striking and looks really cool. And even though it has become tradition for sidekicks to be introduced in the second installment of MCU franchises, War Machine and Falcon being the most obvious examples, I wouldn't consider Hope a sidekick to Scott. Even though Scott has grown a lot as a hero, the skill level is still fairly skewed between the two of them, and because of that and their different approaches, the action is pretty equally divided among the two, especially the final chase which gives each of them even chances to contribute and do cool stuff. Plus there was ample room for more than one hero because the action scenes in this movie are some of the most entertaining in the MCU. Not the best or most gripping, but entertaining. The shrinking hijinks are even more frequent in this movie and used in all sorts of creative and funny ways. You know a joke works when it was in every single trailer and it still gets a laugh in the theater. And there's even more opportunities for more creative action since we've added growing larger to the mix. Back in the day, I was Hank's partner on a project called Goliath. 
All these elements are used the best in the climax during the car chase. A car chase is something we have seen over and over and over in action movies, and personally, I get kind of tired of them unless you have some fun with it. And this brings in all of the hero's abilities to a cliche action set piece to make it way more engaging and enjoyable, and also really funny. Because this movie is really funny, but this is a Marvel movie, so that's really not surprising. Still, credit where credit is due, there's a lot of laugh out loud moments, especially with Scott's crew, who I didn't find particularly interesting last time, but boy did they fix that here. One of my biggest laughs came from Louise, who I couldn't stand before. Give characters a chance, kids, they can win you over with time. And better writing. He also gets to ride a hot rod in the chase scene, so that happened. Why did Hank have that? But since we've gone over how fun and exciting this movie can be, let's go a bit deeper with our sort of main villain. I mean, there's Sonny, but he's pretty inconsequential in the grand scheme. Ava Starr, aka Ghost, played by Hannah John Common. While the promotional material presented Ghost very ominously, the movie doesn't keep up the mystery for long. We find out who and what Ava is pretty quickly. Ava is probably the closest thing we're going to get to an MCU X-Man for a while. She was mutated by a quantum experiment developed by and stolen from Hank, is recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. to be an assassin, another gold star decision on their part, but was eventually taken in by one of Hank's former partners, Bill Foster, played by Lawrence Fishburne, and needs access to the quantum realm to stabilize her condition. This is what I meant before by the villain isn't really a villain. Ava does do villainous things, and throughout the movie is pretty brutal and malicious, but you can tell it's all out of a sense of survival and desperation. She's not trying to gain unlimited power, or dominance of any kind, she's just trying to save her own life. And she does regret her actions by the end. Even if she does villainous things, knowing her whole story right up front makes you sympathize with her in a way. I think it also helps having Bill there as a sort of surrogate father willing to help her, but trying to be a voice of reason as well. It's a sweet relationship that keeps up the family dynamic, and it's nice to know that they manage to get away and maybe they'll show up again someday. Hopefully they survived. Well, you know. And now to someone I haven't mentioned much in the video so far, but mostly because his arc has the most to do with the overall journey, the final conflict, and is probably the strongest character arc in the movie, Hanks. I think I mentioned in the last Ant-Man review that one of Hanks' biggest conflicts is living with the consequences of his actions as Ant-Man, and since the main focus of this movie is following a lead to get Janet back, a chance to correct his greatest mistake, we revisit that idea quite a bit. From Hank having to go back to his former partner for help, damaging his ego, to learning how his technology fell in the wrong hands and led to the creation of Ghost, to his journey into the quantum realm, forcing him to relive the moment where he had to tell Hope that her mother was gone. Jeez! The quantum realm may have been trippy last time, but here it's outright vicious. Although I do like that Hank admires it as beautiful. It's a nice moment that fits him. The movie may be called Ant-Man and the Wasp, but if there is one character who gets the most development, or at least the most exploration, it's Hank. He may be an egotist, which goes without saying since he's a fictional scientist, but he'll drop on the wire, as Cap would put it, for his family, especially for Janet. He's always cared, but his ambitions and the painful consequences of those actions made him closed off. But once he took Scott under his wing and reconnected with Hope enough to let her take on her own own hero mantle, those connections gave him the tools he needed to finally reunite with Janet, played pretty awesomely by Michelle Pfeiffer, who gets this great survival gear look and has inexplicable quantum powers that can fix Ava. So that's cool. You know, with abilities like that, or knowledge of what is practically another plane of being, I bet she's going to be an invaluable asset in the events to come. Hank, quit screwing around. You told me yourself not to screw around. Hank! Oh, come on! Well, gut-wrenching mid credit scene aside, overall, Ant-Man and the Wasp is a great follow-up to the original, improving on a lot of things the first movie introduced that feels like a very natural and satisfying progression. The effects continue to amaze, the performances hit all the right notes, and the concept continues to walk the right line of taking itself seriously but not too seriously. It's just the right amount of funny, sentimental, and action-packed while not forgetting the human element. If you want the perfect encapsulation of what this movie does right, look no further than this moment where Janet is able to talk to her family for the first time in 30 years through Scott. Guys, I had tears rolling down my face in this scene for two very different reasons. It's both very touching and absolutely hilarious in its sincerity. Can we give Paul Rudd a special award just for this scene? 
especially this part. It's not the deepest Marvel movie out there, especially not of 2018, and I don't think the Ant-Man franchise will ever be as compelling as some of its brethren, but it still has a lot of fun and sincerity to offer the MCU, even if it seems like it's doing everything in its power to make sure Scott never gets to join the Avengers. This poor guy can't catch a break. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Yes, I waited until this came out on home media just so I could make that reference for the end credit gag. You're welcome.